Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show, where, as you know, we bring you really interesting guests that can help in some way, shape or form to plan and be prepared and get to early retirement and reach our time freedom point. And so today we have another one of these awesome guests. His name is Jason Parker. And he looked at one of the issues that we are all facing, and that is how do we actually know how to handle our money, both in preparation for retirement as well as during retirement. Retirement. And what he did, and he wrote the book about it and all that kind of stuff, is he developed a calculator that we can use, a retirement budget calculator. And we will talk during our episode today a little bit, how can this calculator actually help you for one, to retirement earlier, but also how can you use it while you're then actually really getting into retirement and all the kind of different things that are associated with that. It should be really fun. Without further ado, let's talk to Jason Parker. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show where we talk with interesting people about how can we actually get an early path to retirement. But then when we're actually getting ourselves on that journey to retirement, we kind of want to know how are we actually doing? And I've been looking around and there are all kinds of cool stuff on Google and so forth. But every so often you got to bring in an expert. And we brought in Jason today because he will tell us where the real calculator is. Jason, welcome to the show. Axel, thank you so much for having me as a guest. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, when I saw that you have invented basically and wrote a book and all that good stuff about retirement calculator, I said to Nadine, who is my little elf in the background, we got to get this guy on the show. So I'm glad you're here. But before we dive into what the calculator does and why you created it, tell us a little bit, how did you get into this whole thing? What's kind of like the origin story? Oh, thank you. Well, before there was the calculator, before there was a book or the podcast, I started out as a financial advisor, helping people make this transition into retirement. I had the good fortune, Axel, of meeting a guy named Dean when I was in my mid-20s. Dean was in his mid-60s at the time, and he became my mentor. And he had owned a broker-dealer in Montana before he had hired me. And I started my career actually in the insurance side of the world. And then two years in the insurance world, started my own RIA, Registered Investment Advisory Firm. So that was my introduction into the financial services arena. And one of the things that has happened over the years, as you know, our podcast now, we have a little over a million downloads on the podcast. And as our audience has grown, there's just so many people out there looking for help. So the question I had was, how can we help more people? And obviously, software is a really great way to help a lot of people you know, just develop what I like to say is clarity, confidence, and freedom is what we want to, to, them to have as they're preparing for retirement. And we can teach people through the podcast, we can teach them through the books, but the calculator actually allows them to put pen to paper and start crunching the numbers for themselves. Yeah, wonderful. That's great. And I think you're doing a great service offering something like this, especially, I think it's fair to say, modern days retirement, especially when we have volatile economic environments, can be pretty tricky to really kind of get a grasp on where are the people in different age groups and what is likely the outcome to be. Now, one other thing I personally find, unless there is an established or growing relationship to a client, I see this on our side regularly, there is a little bit of a hesitation to lay out all the financials to somebody that you're not really that familiar with. So I think it's a wonderful thing to say, okay, well, before I do this, I can get myself a picture. I don't need to have somebody sitting right next to me or I have to look at everything just to see what the tool like your calculator can actually do and what the numbers are. And when the results that show up may not make that much sense, I think there is a little more willingness to say, okay, I see I need help. Right. Rather yeah. than the other way around where people say, here's what you need to do. And if you don't understand why, then let me show you the calculation that is back behind there. So can you say a little bit the components, basically? I mean, I, I guess everybody understands the calculator is designed for making certain inputs. But can you say a little bit what the components and areas are that it covers? Yeah. Well, one of the things that we did different when we were building the retirement budget calculator was we took this whole equation and we 
turned it upside down. Okay. So what most people in the investment industry want to do is they want to say, how much money have you saved? And then they, you know, we've come up with safe withdrawal rates and dynamic withdrawal strategies. And it's like, how much can we take out of the portfolio without running out of money? And that's where a lot of this insecurity comes from. And the reality is the market's always been a volatile place. So that's nothing new. Volatility is nothing new, but it feels different when you don't have a job anymore, when you've decided to retire and you have to live on your income. So rather than taking the approach that most of the industry has taken, which is how much have I saved and how much can I spend? We said, let's make this all about how much do you spend and let that number determine whether or not you've saved enough to be able to retire. And so that's the different, that's the shift with the retirement budget calculators. There's really a focus on understanding what your spending is, both your essential and your discretionary expenses. So retirement really isn't that complicated. I mean, there's a lot of micro decisions you have to make, things like asset allocation and diversification and insurance and Medicare and when you're going to start Social Security. I mean, there's a lot of components to go into retirement, but really in its simplest form, retirement comes down to just three numbers. Uh, the, the first number is you have to have some idea about how long you're going to live. The second number is you have to have some idea about how much money you've saved. And then the third number is you need to know how much money you spend. So when you have some idea for those three different numbers, it really gets to be pretty easy to start putting together a retirement cash flow plan to see if you've saved enough. And that's what we do in the calculator. We, you know, we give people an idea for what life expectancy could be based on the mortality tables from the Social Security Administration. We give them the ability to organize all of their financial data so that they can put all of that information in. And then we give them all of the granularity so that they can really understand their spending. And one of the other things that we do, and you'll like this as a real estate investor, a lot of times the investment community is only focused on the income that you can produce from your liquid investable assets, stocks and bonds and mutual funds and those types of things. But in the retirement budget calculator, what we do is we have an income section where you can actually put in different income sources. So social security or pensions, if you're going to have a side gig, you're going to drive for Uber or something and uh, real estate. So if you have income coming in from rental properties, that income's pretty stable and it increases with inflation over time. You can model that cash flow too, because at the end of the day, retirement is really all about cash flow. It's all about making sure that you have enough income coming in to cover all of your expenses. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for explaining this. And that is actually what I love when people said, you got to have Jason on your show, because I really immediately felt that we have, I don't know if the right term is a bridge or a connection or a bond or whatever. And I don't mean this in an investment sense. But what we as anybody who has listened to our show or has looked at our materials knows, we're always talking about your time freedom number and your time freedom point. And what, when, just to remind uh, people that are maybe listening the first time to the show, what we mean by that is to determine how much am I consuming right now? I'm not really a fan of this idea. And I would be asking you right after my little rant on this thing, why we have been or some people have been trying to condition us to claim that we need less money when we officially say right, we don't want to have a job or I want to retire than we need now. So I've always said, OK, well, if you look at what you're consuming now, let's just say it's four or five thousand dollars a month, then that's kind of like your time freedom number to say, OK, if I can. Let's get assets that are positively cash flowing. So by the time I say, okay, I want to have the freedom to determine what I do with my time, which is my definition of retirement, then mm -hmm. I have secured this amount of money plus whatever inflation is over time so that I can say what I used to need or consume or whatever word you want to use for my daily life, for my car, my house and my vacations and stuff like that's coming in. Right. And then if I have Social Security on top of it or I had some jobs for a while and got 401k money that I can allocate in accordance to the retirement budget calculator and all these other good things. So I think we are tightly connected in that way. Now you have in the name budget and some people on my side of the continent, so to speak, say, well, budget sounds a little bit like sacrifice. Can you talk a little bit why you use budget and what it really means? Yes, thank you. I'll never forget one time I was sitting with some folks and I asked them this question as a married couple. And I said, what do you think about the word budget? When I say the word budget, what does that bring up? And one of them said, it means cutting back. It means, you know, restriction. And the other person said, it means being prudent and being responsible. 
And I think if I were to do it again, I probably wouldn't use the word budget when describing the calculator because it does bring up some positive or negative emotions for people. But again, at the end of the day, like you're saying, retirement is all about cash flow. It's all about that freedom number. It's all about making sure you have enough income coming in to match your expenses, preferably exceed your expenses. I mean, most people that I know didn't work a lifetime just to barely get by in retirement. And I would even argue like this idea of spending less when you retire. That's not what we find what most people want to do. In fact, there have been studies done that show that there's something called the spending smile. When people first retire, they have one another, they have their health. And a lot of times people want to spend more money on discretionary things like travel and visiting the grandkids and buying more stuff at Christmas and and then what happens is slowly over time, you know, a lot of times when people get into their late seventies or mid eighties, they just don't want to travel as much. They don't want to deal with the headaches of the airport. They split a meal when they go out, they drive one car. So some of those discretionary expenses go down at one point. And then unfortunately, what happens for a lot of people near the end of retirement, uh, expenses start to shoot back up for things like healthcare and medical costs. So I think you're right on when you say that people don't want to spend less when they retire. I mean, they've worked their whole life so that they can experience freedom. They can go out and do the things they want to do with the people they want to do them with. And I have to say, you know, some people, they really get into, you know, using like the traditional stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. And some of my friends that have done really well in life have accumulated their wealth through real estate like you have. And so I am not opposed to either one, nor am I necessarily in favor of either one. I think they just have trade-offs. I see a lot of people that are real estate investors where they're doing all of the work. And at some point in their life, you know, I think if you're going to actually be managing properties, it's a job to some degree, unless you outsource it to a property manager. And at some point, people just don't want the work anymore. So I'll see people in their late 70s, early 80s selling their rental properties just because they don't want to have to manage it. And, you know, the other piece to that is my buddy that's done really well investing in real estate. He says, everybody likes to talk about the tax benefits of investing in real estate and the cash flow and the fact that, you know, you don't see the volatility in real estate typically like you do in other asset classes. But he says, nobody ever wants to talk about some of the ugly sides of investing, you know, the person that commits suicide or the domestic violence that takes place and some of those. So, you know, there's trade-offs with everything we do in life. And at the end of the day, though, that freedom number is all about income. It's all about having enough cash flow coming in. And I know a lot of people that have done really well by owning real estate. So, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, one of the things that we preach on our end with Idea Wealth Grower has always been to say, if you invest and you said you were a financial advisor, the advice I'm 99.99% sure was not, okay, if you want to invest in stocks, then you go to this to whichever stock risk you're willing to take. But then the next step you have to do is go to the company and observe if they run their business properly, right? And that's why we are saying, okay, when you're investing in residential real estate, it's a business and your title becomes, besides what your other job is, investor. It doesn't become property manager. And that's there are companies out there. And that's I mentioned before we started recording, we are advising our clients to try the best. And obviously, we share all our resources if somebody joins us to work with turnkey providers where one part of their business is basically managing the properties that they initially renovated, then sold to us and then managed. And that way, we basically provide the funding for them to manage the properties for a fee, admittedly. And then at the end of the day, have the cash flow. And if you take the longer time horizon, like you said, to the middle or the latter end of retirement, depending on when people actually start, those properties one by one by one will actually be paid off. So that mortgage payment, including property tax and insurance, that is initially somewhere in the area of about 50% of the rent income, sometimes even 60% of the rent income will go to like 85% of the rent income comes to you. And every property over time that gets paid off will be a jump in your retirement pay, right? So that's kind of like an important component, I believe, to keep in mind. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you, because I'm sure you have to consider that when you actually create it and then now help people populate the calculator. And that is, there is this notion, not only that we supposedly need less money, but if people made uh, any kind of savings or investments during their work time in IRAs or 401ks or stuff like that, there is this underlying notion 
that when they retire, they would have lower taxes to pay on the money that they basically got tax free while they were still working. And I'm kind of wondering, for one, just to be full transparency, I don't believe that myth because more and more people get older and older and less and less people in most countries that in the world are actually there productively working and being the ones that can be taxed. So I don't really believe the myth that tax is going to come down. But I'm curious, since you actually obviously have to consider that in the calculator, what is your take on taxes and this myth of taxes will be lower when you get older? Well, yeah, it uh, it was a good way to get people to save money. And, you know, starting in the 1970s when tax rates were really high in our country. And so you could defer those taxes into the future. Of course, today we have the Roth accounts that a lot of people are using. And the Roth accounts allow that you don't get the tax break up front, but you do get the tax free growth going forward. And the money grows tax free and then it comes out income tax free and then it goes to your heirs tax free. And taxes are a big part of this, you know, because if you've got a million dollars in your 401k, the reality is only about $750,000 of that you get to use because you're probably going to give over about 25% in taxes to Uncle Sam over time. And then you've got a big tax hit when that money's gone. So you're right. What I found is taxes are one of the, it's an area that confuses people, but it's also an area where most of the people that I've met over the years say, I don't mind paying my fair share in taxes. We love living in America. We want to have good borders and good roads and safe place for our kids to go to school. But they say, I don't want to pay more than my fair share in taxes. And so in the retirement budget calculator, we actually, we built a tax module. Now that's for the paid version of the calculator. So there's a free version of the calculator and there's a paid version of the calculator. But one of the things you do is you enter in these different income sources that you have. And then, so for example, in retirement, a lot of people have social security. Well, we feed that into the tax module. And then we do the calculations to help people understand how much of that social security is going to be taxable. And then also we allow people to set withdrawal rates. So a lot of times people have these different types of income sources. So they might be pulling partly from their IRA and partly from their Roth. They might have some rental income coming in. So we model all of that for people so that they can see how much money are we going to be paying in taxes now? And then how much could we be paying in taxes over time? Now, the tricky thing about taxes is Congress is always messing with those tax laws. And we have, like you were saying, we have some of the lowest tax rates in the history of our country right now. It's hard to imagine taxes going down when we have $31 trillion of debt. I agree with you that I think there's a good probability. We've got Social Security that's not, you know, according to the trustees report, they say that by the year 2032, it's going to have to take a 20% reduction for everybody receiving Social Security in order to keep it solvent. So something's going to happen. Either taxes are going to have to go up or benefits are going to have to be reduced or some people will pay more taxes and some people won't. I mean, that's generally what has happened in the past, but you want to be smart about your taxes. You just, uh, just because you have this deferred tax doesn't mean you shouldn't defer taxes. We found that for some people that are really high income earners today, it does make sense to defer taxes. And then for many people, when they first retire at like say age 60, before they've started social security, They've got this window of time where they can do Roth conversions and get money out of their 401k or their IRAs over to Roths and do it at a time when you're in a lower tax bracket. And we allow people to model that within the calculator. So you can actually go in there and say, hey, you know, when I retire at 61, I want to see what it would look like if I did a Roth conversion that year. And you're right. Taxes are an important piece of this thing. It's not about how much income you have. It's about how much you get to keep after Uncle Sam takes their slice of the pie. So Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's at least one of the many reasons why I like real estate, especially investment real estate, because even if, quote unquote, your heirs or like your family members, hopefully while you're still around, but when they inherit any of those investment properties and they say, I really don't like this thing there in Chicago for whatever reason. They can 1031 exchange it and still don't have to pay taxes. And they can basically then keep the estate plan running with their kids. And if they don't like the thing that they bought in St. Louis out of the one out of Chicago, they 1031 exchange it. And it's very hard to believe or, or to imagine that the government would ever say, oh, we want to do everything government controlled housing and we don't want the private sector anymore. I have a really hard time believing that that's anywhere remotely realistic. So. It is probably very, very, very likely that the government will keep saying we want private people to help us provide housing for the population. 
And to incentivize anybody, those things like 1031 exchange or 27 and a half years depreciation, all those kind of things are there, not because the government is, I think, from my perspective, so generous, but you need to give some incentives, otherwise people would put their money in other places. So I think that that kind of like encapsulates a little bit where real estate and the avoidance in a sense of taxes and paying taxes on all kinds of different income types can be applied. But as I always say, we want to diversify, obviously. Now, yeah. one thing I think that would be interesting for our audience in the context of having a retirement budget calculator is, are there any things, you mentioned it when we started, you know, like people get towards retirement and they kind of want to know where they are. Two questions, actually, in a sense, when and I, I think I know the answer already, but when should people actually get involved with the retirement budget calculator? And have you seen now that you probably have this for a while, you wrote the book, you have people using it, what are maybe one of the things that have the biggest impact, the biggest bang for the buck if people were to change them from what is tradition? Ah, well, a couple of things I'd say there. First of all, going back to this idea about real estate as an investment and all the benefits you get, you know, the 1031 exchange, the depreciation, the cash flow, the inflation adjusted cash flow, the asset that's appreciating, the stepped up basis. I mean, there are a lot of good arguments for real estate. The one thing I would always caution people, though, is that, you know, in partly because I lived through and, and you did too, the housing crisis, the financial crisis that we got into. And I remember, you know, I happened to buy my last house in 2006, right at the top of the market. And it took 12 years. Now, the good news is I lived in that house for 12 years, but it took 12 years for that house to get back to even. And we saw a lot of people get hurt during that time. And part of the reason they got hurt was because they were over leveraged. They didn't have anything to fall back on to be able to continue making payments when everything dropped down. They couldn't weather the storm. So the old saying is that it's the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. And the people that had the liquidity, the people that had the liquidity were the ones that were able to keep going. And you know, I remember stories of people's lines of credit being closed. And so it's like you said, it's all about diversification. You don't want to have all of your eggs in one basket. In yeah, absolutely. Any, in, yeah. Any of these if areas. I'm, can yeah. I just interrupt very quick? I mean, there is really two sides of that coin, right? Like, I mean, you mentioned the story that you lived through for 12 years with your own property. I admittedly had the same experience with the property that we were living in. On the other hand, those investment properties that we had, we had basically never even a day of empty because there were suddenly way more people who needed, they didn't just want to, they oftentimes lived in a house that they got maybe not quite deservedly, I should say, from a financial perspective, but they got it, they lived in it, then they got called by the bank, and then suddenly they needed a place to live. So, you know, on the one hand, I totally with you, I bought a house and <laughs> it took forever to ever break even. Actually, I chastised myself for quite a few times because some of my friends, I call them friends, but they were just people. We all moved into a, one of those tract housing neighborhoods at the same time. We became friends. We did, you know, block parties and stuff like that. And some were smart enough to sell kind of like close to the top of the market. And then the market fell down and my house lost $250,000 in value, right? Yeah. And I was like, oh man, you know, we could have made that money because it, it went even below what I had paid for it. And I was already in it for seven or eight years. So I, I see that part, but I also want to make the audience realize when you are investing and you're basically making these houses available for rent, in a situation like that, there were actually more tenants, more people knocking on our door because they needed to rent when they previously occupied their own houses. So there's kind of like that balance. But back to the point, what would you say? I mean, I, I'm, by the way, for the audience, I mean, Jason is totally right. I don't want anybody to think you should have like everything in real estate, right? We actually have guests on the show about gold or we talked about, you know, whiskey and wine and, and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff. And, you know, there is basically an almost endless supply of different diverse ways to invest money. But back to these kind of some advice that you can see from the application of the calculator that people can maybe do in the run up to this day where they actually want to declare that they retire. Yeah. So the calculator was designed for people who are within five years of retirement. Yeah. So a lot of the people today that are using the calculator are 55 years plus. Okay. Now, younger people that are really just trying to get a handle on their money, the most important lesson that they can ever learn is to tell their money what to do instead of getting to the end of every month and wondering 
where did all the money go? And that is having a budget. So if you're young and you're just getting started, you can use the retirement budget calculator to create a free, I mean, there's no cost associated with that. And that's an important skill set because you, you have to be able to learn to live on less than you have coming in. And unfortunately, some people, they just keep spending and spending and spending their income goes up, but then their lifestyle goes up and they can just never get ahead. They're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and they can't save anything because they're living paycheck to paycheck. And we don't want that for people. Again, we want clarity to know what's most important. We want confidence to know the numbers are going to work. And then we want freedom. We want people to know what it's like to be able to live without having to worry about money and also to not be greedy, like to get, uh, you know, tempted by greed. Those are the the two things that can pull people off track. But really what makes the biggest difference, again, retirement's pretty simple when you focus on the right thing. What too many people focus on how much money have I saved and then try to understand their withdrawal rate. What we're saying is focus on your spending and then let your spending determine whether or not you've saved enough. In the calculator, we created something called the secure income score. And what you have the ability to do is tag expenses as either essential or discretionary. Okay. And then in the calculator, what we do is we take all of your guaranteed income over your lifetime. So measured to the end of the second person's lifetime. And then we take all of your essential expenses. So not the discretionary stuff. Discretionary is essential means you can't live without it. So right, right. shelter and food. Discretionary means, you know, that's your Netflix and your Amazon Prime. If you had to live without it, you could. Yeah, right. My wife would probably argue with me on that, but I, I would say that, you know, you could live without it. Well, on the know. Amazon Prime, I think it might be a matter of uh, actually more efficient <laughs> to have that. The video, I know it's not necessary, <laughs> but the shipping, I think is probably a good deal. <laughs> Yeah, I well, yeah. Anyhow, so you mark expenses essential or discretionary, and then the calculator will compare all of your guaranteed income to all of your essential expenses. And essentially, what we're looking for is that your essential expenses are covered, 80% of your essential expenses are covered by guaranteed income. So that gives people a lot of confidence because if you couldn't do it, you know, a cruise one year or you couldn't do some of the travel that you wanted to do, that's a lot different than not being able to pay your electric bill. Yeah, um, so yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, the, that's one of the things that I always advise people and they've heard me say this on podcasts over and over and over again is, and we touched on it in a sense before when we were talking about like, you know, any IRA or 401k or stuff like that. It's basically somebody saying, okay, I have a job and I give my employer permission to take some of the money that I would otherwise get and put it somewhere. And I have always said, extend that to yourself in your one-on-one -on -one self talk and say, okay, and I'm telling myself, well, basically your bank account to just make a 10% deduction as soon as the money comes in and put it somewhere where you don't get your pause on it, at least not easily. Right? That way you're basically living on nine, since we're using the term budget, you're living on 90% and you're getting used yeah. to it with like everybody. And when you get a raise, the 10% is still 10% going away from the raise. So you will always be on 90% and you will never really, for one, be the 40% of the population who can't handle a $1,000 emergency, but also mm -hmm. you will basically, when you make the transition from basically living your life determined by the other people, externalities, and you become conscious and you want to do things. Like you said, you know, teach your, your money what to do, give it a plan, basically. Then you mm -hmm. will be very glad to say, oh, and by the way, the last 10 years I've always put 10% aside, I never really knew much what I did to do, but uh, so Jason had, can help me as a financial advisor or Axel can help me get into residential real estate or things like that. So that habitual thing then becomes really, really beneficial. And I found many, many people when they really get challenged to live up 90%, they have no problem with that. Yeah, actually, I had the opportunity to speak to a bunch of high school kids recently, seniors in their financial algebra class. They're you know, 17, 18 years old. And one of the things I explained to them, I said, you guys, if you start with $200 today and you can add $200 per month for the next 40 years. So now they're going to be 58 years old, you know, 40 years from now, 57 years old, but $200 a month to start or $200 to start $200 a month. And then if you just invest in something like the S&P 500 that has averaged about 10% per year over time. That $200 a month investment grows to $1.1 $1 million 40 years later. So we don't want people to say, well, nobody ever told me what to do or nobody told me how to do it. You know, you can't have that excuse. You got to take responsibility for this. Nobody's going to come and take care of you if you don't do it. It's not a huge commitment to say $200 a month 
if you're a young person. Now, I, I told those same kids, I said, if you wait until you're 27 to start, so instead of starting when you're 17, start when you're 27, and you start with $200 and save $200 and get 10% per year, instead of having 1.1 million, you have $380,000. So time is really your friend. And some people say, well, there's all this craziness going on in the world right now. I don't want to invest. And the reality is volatility is your friend when you're saving and you've got a long time horizon because your dollar cost averaging in, you're buying stuff when it's cheaper and you will actually end up with more money. So instead of turning on the news at night and saying, oh, look at all this bad stuff. I need to be safe with my money. For young people, they need to be saying, boy, now's the time. I got to shovel as much money into this thing as I can. That changes when you retire because now you don't have time on your side. Now, instead of contributing, now you're reverse dollar cost averaging. When you're taking money out of an account that's falling in value, it's like being stabbed and going to donate blood at the same time. You've got a bad situation and you're making it worse. And we don't, we don't, I mean, risk is just noise until you retire. And then it becomes real risk when you have to start pulling those distributions out of the account. So but like you were saying, it is, it's not all or nothing. It's back to your point was if there's one thing that makes the biggest difference for people, it's starting with a plan. And then once you have the plan developed, then you can back in and say, okay, what are the tools that I should be using to get me there? But too many people, they have no plan. All they're doing is they're investing. They don't even know what they're doing with their investing. A lot of people are just being sold mutual funds that they don't really understand what they're invested in or how they work. And so if you start with the plan and you know where you're going, that's the most important thing is to plan first. And that's the cool thing about the calculator. You know, a lot of people, like a lot of people that want to work with a financial advisor can't work with a financial advisor because most advisors have investment minimums and their right. fees, their fees are pretty high. Right. So, you know, when we built the calculator, my thought was, man, we can give everybody, there's 10,000 people a day in our country heading into retirement right now, all the baby boomers, 10,000 a day. That's a lot of people. Every single one of those people heading into retirement should have a plan, but a lot of them don't. And many of them don't have very much money saved for retirement, but we designed the calculator in a way where every American can really have access to a really good cash flow plan or pennies on the dollar. You know, you're talking $9.95 a month or $95 a year to have access to the calculator. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is a really important point. And one thing that I would like to add on top from my perspective, I want everybody in the audience for one to tell people about Jason and the retirementbudgetcalculator.com to go there. But I think there's an, another thing, if I had anything to say, is don't wait until you're 55 or five years from retirement. Use it in a sense, if you can, it's kind of like scenario planning where you say, OK, well, here is where I am. I can plug in the numbers. I can see where I am right now. And now I can see if I did this or if I did that, how will things actually change? And you will probably find that there are certain things that are really intriguing and give you motivation to do them so that by the time you actually run it again, maybe you want to run it once a year or every quarter or whatever comes up, you can see actually how you're getting closer and closer rather than getting surprised when you say, okay, I think I'm close enough five years away or six years away. Now I run it and get disappointed. So I think both ways would work. If you are at the age group where you're thinking about retiring, definitely get the retirement budget calculator. But if you are younger, I think that shouldn't keep you away from going there. So going there is actually the word here. How can people go there? Where do they need to go, Jason, to get to you? Well, retirementbudgetcalculator.com is the website. And like you were saying, my new book is called Retirement Calculator, Have I Saved Enough to Retire? And so we've got that book. My first book was called Sound Retirement Planning. Uh, Sound Retirement Radio is the podcast I've been doing. And like I say, with that, uh, we got a, a nice audience there. One of the cool things we did, Axel, is um, when people sign up for the premium membership for the Retirement Budget Calculator, we give them access to a private community that's built into the calculator. So this this isn't like a Facebook community. It's actually a we actually built the community portal into the calculator. So the thing about that is I like to think of smart people coming together to share ideas with one another about how they can kind of crowdsource or think collectively about making better decisions as they're making this transition into retirement. And so you don't have to do this alone. Sometimes, you know, uh, retirement is probably the biggest financial decision of your entire life. And it can create a lot of stress and anxiety for people, not just because they're asking the question, have I saved enough? Are we going to be okay? Are we going to run out of money? But also because 
their whole identity is about to change. How they spend their time is about to change. What's important to them. I mean, everything changes in retirement. And a lot of men especially will tell me that they feel a little adrift, a little lost initially because they're not sure what their purpose is because they, you know, they go to a Christmas party and somebody says, what do you do? And they say, I'm retired. And then nobody wants to talk to them anymore, you know? And so <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. Uh, well, that's what I hear as well from some of the people that we work with. They all tell me, well, they and not always traditional retirement age. Oftentimes they retire earlier because they did some very nice investments. And they tell me, well, the first three to six months was kind of nice. I could sleep in and I could do the stuff and I can binge watch and stuff. But then it got boring and I really started mm -hmm. looking for something else, some do charity work or pick up a passion that they never gave themselves time to do. So, yeah, it's a definitely a very, very impactful change in life. So with all of that being said, you know, there's always these two questions at the end of the podcast that I ask everybody. So, Jason, if you could meet anybody past or present, who would it be and why? Well, Jesus, I was an atheist for many years, Axel. Okay. I was kind of raised in a Christian family in my early 20s. I decided to become an atheist. But then in my late 20s, I was fortunate enough to find my way back to my faith. And that one decision, you know, being able to put on a set of goggles and instead of looking at the world through goggles of skepticism, looking at the goggles through uh, belief and faith really just changed my whole attitude and my whole heart and just my feeling towards humanity. So I would, yeah, I would definitely, I would say that Jesus has had the biggest impact in my life. And I, you know, I think there's all these important questions that I'm, I want to ask him one day, but I think at really at the end of the day, I, I probably won't care, you know, once I'm, once I'm yeah. in heaven. So. Well, can you share one of those important questions that you would ask? Yeah. You know, I think part of it, probably like a lot of people, I would want to understand suffering more. Like why, why does a good God that loves his creation allow for suffering, you know, things like that, or there's parts of the Old Testament when I read them that are they really challenge me, and I have to recognize that what I understand today is not what I will understand in the future, and I also have to remind myself who God is and what God is, and when I remind myself that God is love, and then I, I read those verses again, you know, we want to think that there we can live in a world without consequences, and I don't think that's a right reality to, to assume. You know, there you make bad choices in life and there are going to be consequences associated with them. We don't like the consequences. We don't like the judgment, but unfortunately that comes hand in hand with the mercy and the hope and the joy and the peace and everything else that we get for being believers. So, so yeah, probably, that would probably be some of my questions. Like I say, once I'm there, I probably wouldn't care. So no, I, I get that. And I mean, one thing that I have to say, um, everybody should believe in what they want to believe in. The one thing I've oftentimes found is it gets really tricky and can really screw with your mind when you take every single sentence of whichever book you believe in or follow literally by the word of each individual sentence, right? Like, I think we need to have a balance with our individuality and our beliefs. That's just my personal opinion. And as soon as you're willing to do that, then kind of the whole picture gets a little easier to, to find your path and find your way and find your place in it. Now, the other question, the second one, and here the last question for the podcast is, if you had a time machine, you could go forward or backward, you can know and know what you know, you're just not allowed to change the space-time continuum for the benefit of all of us. So where would you go in mind? Well, I'd probably go right back to the same thing. You know, I'd want to hear Jesus give the Sermon on the Mount, or I'd want to see Peter step off the boat and walk on water and uh, in that moment of faith, but then see him start to sink as his disbelief came in. You know, I because I had the experience of walking life as an atheist, because I had the experience of getting to know what it's like to see the world through those goggles, and then have this wonderful experience of being able to see what it's like to look at the world through goggles of faith and belief. I just would encourage anybody that's listening to, you know, you will find whatever evidence you need based on whatever point of view you come from. So when I was an atheist and I saw the world through my atheist goggles, I could find every argument to believe why I wanted to believe that. When I became a believer and I put on my believer goggles, I was, I've was i been able to see the world through a different set of goggles. And I, I will tell you one one path leads to, I would say, a world that's not beautiful and it's not full of joy and hope and peace and love. And then there's another set of goggles that you do get to see the world through that perspective. And to me, like I say, 
I mean, everybody's got to find their own way. Like you say, I'm just grateful that I had the good fortune to be like the prodigal son that they talk about in the Bible who turned away from God and then got to experience what it's like to have a loving God come running for, to you with open arms and say, welcome, welcome home. So that's where I'd want to be. Okay, very cool. Well, when you come back, you can tell us of all the stories that we found in the book were actually true or if they enhanced them a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so, Jason, one more time, how can people get in touch with you? Well, I really don't want them to get in touch with me one on one. I want them to try the calculator. I want them to put together a plan for themselves. And that's through retirementbudgetcalculator.com. Okay, well, that's awesome. And we put that and the links to your books and stuff all in the show notes. So, people can actually find it. One thing that I want to ask our audience at the end of our conversation, we have learned if you're listening to us on Apple or Google or Spotify or so forth, that what is actually ranking podcasts is the number of downloads. It's not just the number of people that are listening. So I want to actually encourage everybody to download the podcast if you can. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comments below and then we will actually look for answering those or go back to Jason and, and help him ask him to help the, give the answers. The other part is if you have any ideas of what other podcast topics we should basically bring guests in for, we would be very grateful. So Jason, thank you for your time and for your wisdom and for creating something where you can comfortably say, well, it doesn't take me. You can just go to the website and use the calculator and find out where you stand. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate being a guest on your show, Axel. Thanks for the work you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Ideal Investor Show. More info and the links we mentioned during the show are in the show notes or you can go to our website at idealwealthgrower.com and sign up for the Apple Podcast link. And if you like to talk to me, sign up for a strategy call. Hopefully you want to share what you learned with your network and bring more people in. We are really eager to hear your comments. And until next time, be well, stay safe and ciao.